Live from the Scripps Studios, this is 10 News. We're not thinking people are going to call us these things while we're trying to go to the bathroom. That girl is one of the many Lincoln High School students who say they were racially taunted during a recent football game. Good evening, I'm Lindsay Pena. And I'm Derek Stallin for Steve Atkinson. The incident unfolded Friday night, but the fallout continues with investigations by both schools. New at 5, 10 News reporter Mackenzie Maynard is joining us. And Mackenzie, this is the first time we're hearing from those students. This is the first time that drill team member is talking since Friday night's game. The sophomore tells me this is actually the first time she's ever experienced something like this. Today, her and her team were back out here at practice. What started out just like any other football game quickly took a turn for the worse. Lillian Mixon is a member of Lincoln High School's drill team. While her and her teammates were back at practice Tuesday, they're all still replaying what happened Friday night. We're going in a group to the bathroom during halftime, and a little boy, he asked me if I do flag or twirl, and I told him, no, I dance, I do drill, and he responded with the N-word. Not once. A lady was talking to me, but I wasn't listening because I was trying to get back to the bleachers. I didn't know what she was saying, and I heard her call me the N-word. But twice. And I was confused, and I was oh, like, did she say the N-word to me? Because this is a grown woman. San Clemente High School and Orange County Sheriff's released this statement saying in part, at the game, an individual told deputies that the San Clemente middle school students were on the visitor's side being rowdy and obnoxious. Deputies removed them from the area. They say there was no mention of inappropriate language or hate speech. I spoke up about it because I feel like it's not right and that this should not happen. The statement identifies two times people approached deputies and both times they say hate speech was never mentioned. I told the security guard that they were saying racial things to us and the guy, he looked at me and he didn't respond. He just looked and turned away. At the end of the game, Lincoln High students and coaches were escorted to their buses like they normally do in San Clemente after every game. After this whole situation is over, that they realize that they should never say that to someone. She tells me today, since she first shared her story on social media, she's received a lot of hateful and hurtful messages. She says all she's trying to do is make sure this never happens to anyone again. As for both school districts, they're still continuing their investigation into the allegations. For now, reporting live, Mackenzie Maynard, 10 News. Mackenzie, thanks. Now, within just the last hour, President Trump landed in Los Angeles for the next stop on his fundraising tour through California. Tonight, he'll spend some time at real estate developer Jeffrey Palmer's home in Beverly Hills. And protests are expected. The GOP says they expect to raise more than $15 million from these various fundraisers. And of course, tomorrow, the president will head to San Diego. And this evening, we are learning new information about President Trump's visit tomorrow to our area in that statewide fundraising tour. 10 News reporter John Horn is live in the newsroom. And John, we can also expect to hear from the president on this visit. That's right, and that should come a little bit later in the day. Sources telling 10 News that it's going to start with a luncheon, a fundraising luncheon over at the U.S. Grant Hotel in downtown. Then it will go down to the border, and that's where we can expect to hear and see more of the president as he likely touts his signature campaign promise of building that wall. President Trump saving a visit to San Diego for the end of his two-day swing down the Pacific coast. His time here will start with a luncheon at what is believed to be the U.S. Grant Hotel downtown. Individual tickets start at $2,800, but it's a minimum of more than $35,000 per couple for a photo op. Even though he's going to be jeered by, by protesters, he's going to face a lot of flack, He's also going to raise a lot of money. Trump began his fundraising earlier Tuesday in Palo Alto before heading down to Beverly Hills. He has one private event in downtown Los Angeles Wednesday morning before flying to San Diego. In all, he's expected to raise $15 million for the 2020 campaign. There's still a lot of voters who love this president, even in this 
bastion of Democrats. UC San Diego political scientist Thad Kauser noted that more than 4 million Californians supported Trump in 2016. But he also says the trip is giving the president a key opportunity. He'll reach a national audience from inside California, his political nemesis. His administration has been at war with the state on the environment, on immigration, on issue after issue, on the border. Sources telling 10 News that Trump will head to the border after the luncheon. In February, the president circumvented Congress and declared a national emergency to divert billions of dollars toward a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border, his signature campaign promise. Earlier this month, the Department of Defense announced $3.6 billion to fund 11 different wall-related projects. The only hint earlier today outside the Grant Hotel of the president coming were some signs restricting parking, eliminating parking next to the hotel from 1 a.m. to 3 p.m. So good to know if you're going to be in downtown tomorrow. For now, live in the newsroom, John Horn, 10 News. Thank you, John. 10 News will have complete coverage of the president's visit tomorrow. You can also follow us online at 10 News on the 10 News mobile app. Today, police identified the man wounded in a shootout with officers in Logan Heights. They say 30-year-old Enrique Aguilar came at officers with a gun pointing at them. Now, a warning to you tonight, the video of this shootout may be upsetting to some viewers. The shooting happened just after 3 p.m. yesterday and was captured on video by a 10 News viewer. Police tried to stop two men suspected of drug dealing. That's how it started. They say Aguilar fled with a handgun. The video shows officers yelling at him to drop that weapon, but instead police say he opened fire and officers responded in kind. Retired San Diego Police Lieutenant Ray Shea says the officers did everything by the book. Yes, I think those officers were very brave. I think they did a great job. After the initial gunfire of the suspect dropping, they approached the suspect and they handcuffed him quickly. Aguilar is expected to survive his injuries. The two officers involved in the shooting were not hurt. There are new developments as protesters call for the city of San Diego to suspend smart street lights, calling them an invasion of privacy. They want concerns about privacy and surveillance addressed. But as 10 News reporter Mimi Alcala explains, police say they've helped with criminal investigations. And the group wants the city to put an end to its smart street light program until they figure out what kind of data is being collected and who exactly has access to it. So this is what the smart street lights look like. They look like regular street lights, but they have cameras, microphones and sensors on them. And some people are concerned they're being watched and tracked without knowing where their information is going. We have the right to say we need more information. And until we get that information, you have to stop using these cameras. The group of activists standing outside of City Hall say this type of technology is invasive, going as far as to calling it spying. And they say it's monitoring certain areas of the city and places of worship more than others. There's a high concentration of these cameras around mosques and worship centers. That is very, very alarming. The city council approved 14,000 of these smart street lights to be installed citywide. A few thousand are already up and running with more on the way. Here's a map showing where they're currently located. The way that this conversation came to city council, it was couched in a conversation about environmental benefits. They're not only an energy efficient alternative to the old lights, but the city says it uses them for things like collecting data for improving intersections and parking. But San Diego Police Department has used the technology to solve crimes. This was not supposed to be a crime prevention tool. Regardless, they've helped police find important clues in serious cases. Earlier this month, prosecutors said cameras on these streetlights revealed the identity of a masked man suspected of shooting and killing a downtown business owner. During a court hearing, prosecutors said the streetlight cameras captured that man, Kevin Cartwright, walking away from the scene where Tony Rada was killed in the East Village. They tracked the suspect through the streets of downtown, and 12 blocks later, his mask is removed and identity revealed. There is obviously a great benefit for the use of these cameras for crime prevention and for investigating and solving crimes that have happened. However, this cannot be pitted against our privacy interests and our rights under the Constitution to be free from unnecessary surveillance. And the group is sending a letter to the mayor asking that the city halt the use of these cameras until more information and public records about the data collected can be revealed. I've reached out to both the mayor's office and SDPD for their response on this, but still haven't heard back. Reporting downtown, Mimi Alcala, 10 News.
Now to a crime alert. The FBI needs your help identifying a woman they say robbed two local banks. These surveillance photos of that woman were released today. Authorities say she robbed a U.S. bank inside of Vons on El Cajon Boulevard on September 12th. Just yesterday, they say that same woman robbed a Wells Fargo also inside of Vons on University Avenue in La Mesa. In both incidents, the woman handed a note to the teller demanding money. She got away with an unknown amount of cash. The DA's office is making progress on its mission to lower the countywide backlog of untested rape kits. Over the last year and a half, more than 1,600 kits have been sent to a lab for testing. Results from more than 1,300 of those kits are now being uploaded into the FBI's national database. Tomorrow, a group called Heartfelt Voices United plans to gather outside City Hall to bring awareness to the lag in getting kits tested. Now to a developing story. A California man has become the seventh person to die from a vaping-related illness in the U.S. As ABC's Megan Tavrizian explains, the nation's leading health agency is activating emergency operations to better investigate the outbreak of lung injuries associated with e-cigarettes. California, the latest state to take a stand against flavored e-cigarettes, often used by teens and young adults. Again, we're pushing the envelope. We'll see how far we can go. Governor Gavin Newsom calling for warning labels, an awareness campaign, and removal of illegal vaping products. This comes after another reported death overnight connected to e-cigarettes, this time near Fresno, California. Now the Centers for Disease Control activating an emergency operations center in response to the growing number of lung injury cases associated with e-cigarettes. The latest numbers, at least six people dead across six states and at least 380 cases of lung illness reported across 36 states and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We've got to convince students first that it's a bad idea to vape. We've got to convince their parents that it's not a harmless cloud of smoke around their heads. Health officials from coast to coast encouraging Americans to stop vaping while trying to figure out what's causing people to get sick. In Chicago, public schools now banning vaping on or near the campuses. And in New York, e-cigarette stores scrambling to follow a new statewide ban of flavored e-cigarettes. So the, the manufacturer doesn't have any idea, the wholesaler doesn't have an idea, the retailer doesn't have an idea. So what do we do with the inventory right now? The federal government is working to ban flavored e-cigarettes, the agency says, appeals to children. According to their estimates, more than a quarter of American high school students are current e-cigarette users. Megan Tavrizian, ABC News, New York. A San Diego woman is a whole lot richer. She just came forward to claim a Mega Millions prize of half a billion dollars. <laughs> Larney Bible bought the winning $522 million ticket at a deli mart in Sorrento Valley this past June. She says she kept the ticket hidden and used the lottery's winner's handbook for guidance, which coached her to wait to learn how to navigate her newfound riches. She's taken the cash option, 340 million bucks before taxes, and she says she plans to use the winnings to pay off debt and buy a house.